everyone. My name is Mary Brown. I'm the guide manager here at Alpine Ascent International. I'm calling in from the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Duwamish peoples, past and present. Past and present. We get a ton of calls here at Alpine Ascent headquarters from aspiring mountaineers who want to know where to begin their climbing journey. Colshan, also known as Mount Baker, offers the perfect introduction to mountaineering and is often considered the best glacier training venue in the lower 48. Lead guide Brooke Warren has guided and taught in the mountains all over Washington, Alaska, and Colorado, but Colshan holds a special place in her heart. She always says the best alpine sunrises and sunsets are from Sandy Camp. Today, she'll walk us through the climb from start to finish and answer any questions you have about this classic trip. We're going to be talking about climbing Kulshan, otherwise known as Mount Baker. Um, during this presentation, feel free to ask questions in the chat, like Mary said, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, often there's lots of questions about gear specifics and stuff like that. Um, but what are, can you expect on your three-day climb with Alpine Ascents? We do tons of three-day climbs on Mount Baker because it is such a great beginner mountain. Uh, but just to start off with, um, some little facts about Mount Baker. It is the youngest volcano of a series of volcanoes that go up into Canada that have been active for about 1.3 million years, and Mount Baker is actually still active. You can smell the sulfur steam rising from the crater while you're hiking up the mountain, and I've even found elemental sulfur stones and crystals on the upper mountain um, in 2021 when there was a huge heat wave and the glacier melted away. Uh, it lies about 30 miles east of Bellingham Bay and 16 miles south of the Canadian border. Um, the Juan de Fuca fault line is kind of the, where the source of the volcanic activity comes from. And that's why there's kind of a line of mountains, of uh, volcanoes all down like the coast of Washington. Um, one thing I will note, our three-day trip does go up the Easton Glacier, which you can see in this image going up towards the, the summit. Um, just some quick landmarks here. We've got Grant Peak, which is actually where the summit of the Mount Baker or Colshin Massif is. It's at 10,781 feet. Uh, Sherman Peak to the right is another peak um, on the Mount Baker Massif. Um, it's more pointy, but we're not going to be summiting that one. It's a little bit lower. In between the two is actually the crater. You'll see a saddle in between those two high points, um, and that's the crater. It's one of our landmarks, one of our stops, spots that we take a break, and you can also look inside the active crater. Um, to the left, you'll see the Black Buttes. Um, this is pointing to Colfax Peak, which is one of the Black Buttes, um, and they're basically some jaggedy, rocky mountains um, that are also part of kind of that greater uh, Colshin Massif. Underneath the Black Buttes arrow, you can see camp. And if you look really closely at that image, um, you might be able to see a yellow tent underneath that arrow. That's where we have our camp set up for our trips. Um, we are really lucky to have a, an agreement with the Forest Service to be able to um, have a, an established camp up on Mount Baker on the Easton Glacier route uh, during our busy season. And what we, this does is we continually occupy it so that our, uh, so that we can maintain the tents and everything, but it basically allows us to not have to carry tents or kitchen supplies and everything like that up the mountain. It makes your pack lighter. Below our camp is Sandy Camp, which is the location where most other climbers are going to be camping. You can see a blue tent off to the right. And then just the, the big white expanse on, on the mountain is the Easton Glacier. Before I tell you all about our itinerary, I want to acknowledge that Mount Baker National Forest is on the ancestral lands of the Upper Skagit Tribe, the Nooksack Tribe, the Samish Tribe, and the Still Guamish Tribe, and the Silk Seattle Tribe. Um, land acknowledgement is important to uplifting the voices and experiences of the Indigenous people who have lived on this land. Um, it doesn't really take the place of authentic um, connections with these people and these communities, but it does acknowledge that they still live here and are stewards of this land. In addition, um, I wanted to acknowledge that we are visitors here on this in this space. Um, this is home to many different types of wildlife, including mountain goats, wild thistle and bumblebees, some lupins marmots, um, fireweed, which is a resilient plant that actually crops up um, in areas of disturbance, such as after wildfires or after a glacier has carved out a valley. 
and blueberries. If you come here in the later end, end of the summer, you might be able to pick some blueberries on your approach hike. And I just wanted to show just a couple of these different types of flora and fauna that live here to show that there's tons of uh, native plants and animals that exist here and we want to keep the place pristine so that they can thrive in this environment. Now on to our experience on the mountain. Your experience is going to start with a gear check at our office at 4 p.m. the day before your climb. Um, your, our office is in Queen Anne um, at 109 West Mercer Street. During the gear check, you'll be able to make sure that you have all the correct equipment, buy any equipment that you don't have or rent equipment that you don't have. Uh, you'll also be able to pay for any of that. And you'll also pick up maybe um, some hot drink options or uh, soup options to supplement your meals. Um, we will be cooking breakfast and dinner for you, uh, but you'll be responsible for bringing your snack food or your lunch food. The next day, uh, now I'm going to be giving you a an overview of like the whole route. The itinerary is pretty much always the same for our three day Mount Baker trips on the Eastern Glacier, but it might change slightly depending on weather or guide preference. On the first day, you will depart from our Alpine Ascents office from 109 West Mercer Street and head up to Schreiber's Meadow or Park Butte Trailhead. Um, and it'll be about a two and a half hour journey. We'll drive you in a van. Uh, some people ask whether they can drive their own vehicle because maybe they're heading somewhere else and they don't wanna go back to Seattle after their trip. That's totally appropriate. You'll just need to communicate with your guides so that they know where to meet you and, um, and timing. During this drive, you'll probably take a stop to go uh, to have breakfast or maybe get some coffee. And you'll also pick up your guides in Cedro Woolley, which is right underneath that two hour, 35 minute uh, mark before you head to the trailhead. At the trailhead, uh, which is at 3,400 feet, you will pack your bags and make sure that, oh, well, you're gonna have your bags packed, but you're gonna finish packing your bags. And what that means is putting your boots, your um, helmets, maybe your ice axe on the outside of your pack properly, and then you'll get ready to go. Maybe you'll get to take a cool group photo like this. But I also wanted to acknowledge that it is not always beautiful and sunny on Mount Baker. Um, Sometimes it is quite wet. Um, Mount Baker is in an area that gets a lot of rainfall. And so you might have to hike up in the rain or even climb the mountain in precipitation. Uh, make sure that you have uh, proper vortex and hard shell layers um, in order to prepare for this kind of event. Um, I look pretty miserable in this rainy picture, but I promise I was having fun. <laughs> this is a map that shows where the trailhead begins. And then you're gonna do the approach hike. The approach hike in total is about 3000 feet of elevation gain, and it's almost four miles. I would say it's probably around more like 3.5 miles. Um, and during that ascent, you're gonna take three to four breaks. Those breaks are maintenance breaks. Basically you'll eat food, drink water, and maybe go to the bathroom during those breaks. They're about 10 to 15 minutes long with an hour long of walking in between. This pattern of walking for an hour and taking a break for 10 to 15 minutes allows us to prepare for our summit day because it's the same rhythm that we'll have on the summit day. And it also helps you um, maintain endurance and allows us to assess your abilities to continue on up the mountain. Like I said before, your pack will be a little bit lighter than some, uh, some of our other trips because we have camp established. So you'll have about a 40 pound pack, give or take a few pounds. After about a mile of walking on semi-flat ground in Alpine Meadows, um, you'll get to about 3,800 feet uh, in a stream crossing. Oftentimes there's a bridge here um, that's put up by the Forest Service, but sometimes the bridge gets washed out as in the case in this photo where we had to rock hop. Uh, this is a map of where this stream crossing is. And then after the stream crossing, you'll be heading up switchbacks to a higher elevation. This is the landmark for when you know that the grade or the pitch of the trail is going to increase. You're going to start walking uphill after this stream crossing. You'll walk uphill for about another mile and you'll exit uh, kind of the dense tree line at about 4,600 feet into these beautiful alpine meadows. You can see some pink heather on the sides, um, some very well-packed packs. 
You'll also notice that there's some really nice stone steps on the trail here. The trail crews that maintain the trails in this region are super awesome. I think the Washington Trails Association, um, the National Forest, I think there's even like a horse packers organization that helps work on the trail maintenance. So sometimes you'll see people working on it. Definitely thank them for the hard work that they do. Uh, this is a really heavy trafficked area, so the trail maintenance is important, and it's also important us, for us to actually walk on the trail. Um, as you can see here, if sometimes it gets muddy if it's raining, and people will tend to walk off the trail so they don't have to walk through the muddy trail. And I would say, don't do that. Walk on the nicely, nicely um, maintained trail, because if you walk off of it, it's just going to erode the trail, and it's going to impact these beautiful alpine meadows here. This is an image of where this photo was taken, just at this fork here. The left-hand fork goes to Park Butte, where there is a fire outlook, and you might be able to see it glinting in the sun from camp. And then the right trailhead takes us towards the Easton Glacier. You'll enter the railroad grade um, around 4,800 feet, just a little further on from where that previous photo was taken. Um, the railroad grade is called such because they say that it's the steepest grade that a train could go up. That's what I've heard at least. Um, so maybe that's true. Uh, and then on the railroad grade, you'll see uh, this is where it is on a map. Um, it's kind of a long straight ridge line. And this is what it looks like looking down it. So you'll notice that one side is this beautiful kind of low angle foliated meadow. And on the other side is a super rocky steep terrain. This railroad grade is actually a lateral glacial moraine. And so you're walking on the deposits left behind from when the glacier carved out this valley. You can also see the Rocky Creek down below, which is where the glacier is melting out and sending water down this valley. The railroad glade itself, um, you'll basically ascend a thousand feet in one mile. Um, so it should take you about an hour to go up this, uh, this section. Then you'll reach camp at around 6,200 feet. Uh, our camp up here, like I said before, is established. And so you don't have to carry your tents up. Um, we maintain it throughout the season. Um, sometimes it's beautiful and it looks like this, like I, like Mary said at the beginning, the sunsets here are amazing. Um, this is where camp is located on a map. You'll also notice that there's other spots that people are camped that you'll notice where other people are camped as you're hiking up the railroad grade and other parts of the approach trail. Um, this is probably either other guide services or members of the public who are also climbing the mountain. Um, we tend to camp a little bit higher just so that we're a little bit out of the way from everybody else. So we're not um, disturbing anybody else or nobody else is disturbing us. This is another photo of the same camp. So you can see that it can look very um, summery or it can look very wintry. When it is in these snowy conditions, the guides have to do a lot of work to make sure that the tents stay staked down. Um, sometimes the snow can melt out at around like one to two feet a day. I've even seen it when it's really hot out. Um, in this picture, you'll also see a bear can. The bear can is not for bears. It is for rodents. Um, the mice and other rodents like to uh, nibble at our food up here. And so in order to prevent them from doing that, and in order to prevent them from uh, learning that this is a great place to find food, we contain all of our food and fragrant items inside these bear cans. Uh, each tent or each person in each tent is gonna have, or maybe it's just each tent is gonna have their own bear can to contain their snack items in. You'll also see the ice axe and crampons stacked next to the tent. Um, it's important to, uh, deposit your sharp items, such as your poles, ice axe, and crampons um, away from the tent, not ne directly next to it, because it can't, it would be a bad thing if it were to rip the tent. Uh, sometimes we also establish a central location where everybody's ice axes and other sharps are um, collected in one place. You can see this is probably after a summit day as there's some jackets and other things out uh, drying out on top of the tents. During that first day, after you arrive in camp and set up your sleeping bags in your tent, you'll do snow school. This is probably the most beautiful uh, location I've ever had to uh, 
the be most beautiful classroom I've ever taught in. Um, you can see the vast landscape of the Easton Glacier as well as the Deming Glacier off to the left underneath the Black Buttes. You can also see a lenticular cloud on the top of uh, Colshin. Uh, the lenticular clouds are really cool kind of spaceship-like clouds and they signify very strong winds. So sometimes it can be dangerous to summit in this type of weather, even though it looks beautiful down low. You'll also see a glacial tarn in the bottom of this photo um, underneath where the climbers are practicing uh, cramponing technique. The glacial tarn is basically snow melt. It's a snow melt lake, essentially. During snow school, like I said, you're going to practice crampon technique, um, which is how to walk in crampons and how to walk in snow. You'll practice ice axe arrest and roped glacier travel. During ice axe arrest, you will practice both self arrest and team um, ice axe arrest in the case if one of your rope team members were to fall into a crevasse or fall down, um, just to ensure that you don't all go in there. Um, and there's, a, there's some technique to this. So you'll go over all of that technique. You'll also cover roped glacier travel, um, uphill, downhill, pacing, how to clip into the rope, how to put your harness on, um, and everything else involved in that. At the end of the day, your guides are going to cook you a delicious meal. Um, this here is a fancy ramen. Uh, we have a we have a whole list of delicious um, meals, including ramen. I think we've had sloppy joes in the past. We've had burritos. There's a bunch of different things on the menu that are different options. Just make sure that you tell our staff ahead of time uh, whether or not you have a dietary restriction so that we can account for that when we're packing our food. On day two, you'll probably have an alpine start, which means you'll probably get up in the dark. Uh, sometime around three to five is generally when I get up, depending on the time of year. Um, but you'll need to have your headlamp on and be preparing yourself in the dark. It's beautiful. You can see people's headlamps kind of sneaking up the glacier. Um, it's a really cool time of day to be awake. On leg one, there's four legs total in the ascent on summit day. Leg one will take you from about 6,200 feet at camp to about 7,400 feet. You'll see the black buttes in the, in the background there, walking around various crevasses on the glacier. And then once you've walked for about an hour and you've reached that new elevation, you'll have a break for about 10 to 15 minutes. Like I said before, um, we will be following a pattern of walking for about an hour or about a thousand feet, and then taking a 10 to 15 minute maintenance break. You'll notice that during the break, we are still tied together on the rope um, to manage the risk of being on the glacier. Um, and we'll actually take our breaks spread out in lines. Um, and that means you also will have to go to the bathroom while attached to the rope, um, except for one spot, which is next to the crater. Uh, there are some options to kind of hide behind some snow berms. Leg two will take you from 7,400 feet to about 8,600 feet. You can see this team of um, climbers here is cruising around a big crack in the glacier and avoiding that. Uh, you can also see the layers of the cascades in the background there. And if you look right above the 8,600 feet, you'll see Glacier Peak, which is another mountain or another volcano that we climb um, and guide at Alpine Ascents. It's one of the most remote volcanoes, glaciated volcanoes in Washington. Then you'll take go from 8,600 feet to 9,800 feet in leg three, uh, where we'll, which will bring you to the crater. Um, you can see kind of where the crater exactly is via that arrow. Um, you'll know that you're getting close because you'll see that crater and the rock outcropping to the right, um, but it might look different. It could also look like this. Uh, that previous photo was taken in 2021 when there was a massive heat wave and it melted out a ton of the glacier on the mountain. And this picture was taken in, I think in June of 2022, um, where the glacier was covered in, or uh, the rocks were covered in rime. So it's pretty wild to see how much the weather uh, can affect the conditions on the mountain. You'll also see in this image, this group of climbers all gathered together, taking a break. Um, we will probably do the same there. This is a, um, Risk management wise, we are able to gather together because the risk of falling to crevasse is lower at this particular location. 
Um, it's right at the edge of the glacier. Um, and you'll also hopefully be able to get a chance to look inside the crater and see the sulfur steam rising. Leg four will take you from the crater up the Roman wall to the summit at about 10,780 feet. Um, this picture is taken on the Roman wall, actually on the way back down, and you can see the crater is down near the base of those rocks on the right-hand side of the photo. You can also see the inkling of a giant bergschrund or a giant crack right below that climber with the red backpack. Here's that bergschrund again. The bergschrund is the place where the, the glacier is kind of peeling away from the mountain. Um, and it kind of creates some pretty large cracks. There's still glacier, glacier above this, but we call this the Bergschrund. It's the biggest crack that always forms on the Roman wall. The Roman wall itself just goes from 9,800 feet to about 10,500 feet. Um, and it's about 40 degrees um, in terms of steepness. Here, our intrepid guide, Hannah, is, um, is uh, leading the way up the wall here. And then you'll get to the summit plateau and you'll see this view. So you'll walk across the summit pl plateau. It'll probably take about 10 to 15 minutes and you'll see this little knob that's the summit. And um, you'll probably take a break where those people are gathered below the knob and unrope and you'll get to walk up to the very tippy top unroped. Um, in total, the summit day is about 4,500 feet of elevation gain, about three miles up and about six miles total to get back to camp. It should take you somewhere between five to seven hours to get to the top. Um, and half of that time to get back down. So about eight to 10 hours on your feet total. So it does take some endurance to be walking and moving for that long. At the summit, you'll probably take a group photo and maybe even get to sign, sign the summit register. Um, sometimes it uh, is covered in snow though. You may have noticed some of my elevation of the mountains say, 10,784, some, some of them say 10,781. And I think that is a discrepancy between when there's a lot of snow on the top of the mountain and when it is devoid of snow. For your descent, um, it is important to note that even though we do have all day to climb the mountain, we don't have to go all the way back to the trailhead. Descending in a timely manner is still important. As you can see, these folks are crossing uh, quite a thin, um, crevasse bridge or um, bridge between two crevasses. And we wanna make sure that we're descending in a timely manner so that we're coming down when it's not too soft or the bridges won't collapse. Additionally, once the snow gets too, too soft, you can start post holing, which can be quite uncomfortable depending on the conditions. Um, and so you do actually wanna descend in a timely manner because you also don't wanna be on your feet for like longer than 10 hours. It can get really uncomfortable, even if you're a fit person. Back at camp, hopefully you will get the opportunity to watch some beautiful sunsets. Um, you can see that the San Juan Islands in the background here um, in Bellingham Bay in the Puget Sound, um, the way that the light shines on these is pretty wild. It's like the most bright orange you'll ever see. Um, but sometimes the weather is no good and you might have to just hide in your tent. Day three, you'll pack up, you'll have a great breakfast, maybe a leisurely breakfast, you'll pack up your stuff back into your backpack, and you'll head back down to the trailhead. Um, you might even get to glissade if there's enough snow because you're no longer on the glacier at this point. But oftentimes this region, which is basically from our camp looking down into Sandy Camp, uh, is often just talus later in the summer. Um, once you get back down to the trailhead, you'll head back out um, and get a ride back to the office where you will hand back any rental gear um, and say goodbye to your newfound uh, summiting friends. I do want to make a note about training for this peak. Um, like Mary said, it is a great beginner climb, but it also does take some fitness and some endurance to climb. Um, this is a real glacier. It's a real mountaineering mountain. Um, and you will be carrying a heavy pack, especially on your approach day. For your summit day, it's probably gonna be more like 15 pounds. We did a great webinar about training earlier um, this season in I think January or something. Uh, Lyra, who is one of our senior guides, as well as a personal trainer, um, did a great thorough look at how to train specifically for mountaineering, which I highly recommend you look at. Uh, Mary might be able to put a link into the chat right now about that. 
but I'll just do a quick summarization. So first of all, um, you're going to want to establish some sort of baseline fitness. Um, make sure that you're doing some sort of movement every day and fueling your body appropriately for that movement. Make sure you're fueling your body with real food, both while you're training and while you're on the mountain. Um, daily movement that's fun for you will make you uh, maintain this baseline fitness. You're also going to want to establish some sort of endurance. So when I talk about endurance, I mean multiple hours at a time um, and walk for like move for at least an hour and then fuel similar to how we would go on our trip. Um, so you want to mimic what the trip itself is going to look like. Move for an hour, walk for an hour, take a 10, 15 minute break, walk for another hour, take a 10, 15 minute break. If you can go on a six hour day, that's ideal. And zone one to two heart rate is a great pace for these endurance trainings. Um, which is how I think about that as like, it's a conversational pace. And then additionally for training, you're always going to want to make it sport specific. So make sure you're carrying um, a weighted pack for some of your training. So you can get used to that. If you've gone back, going backpacking is a great way to train for this. Um, walk uphill and downhill. A lot of people fail to uh, practice going downhill and then they just get totally worked going downhill because um, their quads just are on fire. You also want to make sure you're training on uneven surfaces and using your equipment, such as your mountain boots or anything like that. Um, because even though the, like, you know, stair masters, treadmills, whatever, they're great training, especially if you don't have access to a hillside, um, you still want to practice on some sort of uneven surface because it helps with those stabilizer muscles that keep you in balance. And then finally, this is the time for questions. So ask away, uh, let us know if you have any questions. This is a marmot by the way. Um, so marmots are one of the native animals that live up on Mount Baker. You also see them on Rainier and like all over the Cascades, but they are hilarious and so adorable. <laughs> so cute. Brooke, thanks so much for that webinar presentation. It was amazing. I can't believe you took all of those photos because they're so beautiful. And also, it's a great sunset and sunrises. Um, okay, time for questions. Okay, we have one in the chat. What is the upper age limit you typically see by folks reaching the summit? Or does that make sense? Yes. So, yeah. like, what's the oldest person I've seen yeah. at the summit? I would say, I would say, I've, I think I've taken people in their 60s and 70s up there for sure. Okay. Um, I, I don't know the exact upper age limit, but I mean, as long as you have the fitness, I think that age doesn't really matter in terms, you know, like if you are a strong, healthy person, then you can definitely try. Totally. Vern Tejas, one of our senior guys here at Alpine Ascent, just turned 70 last month or a couple of weeks ago. And he is still guiding on Vincent. He's guiding Finale in a few weeks and he is just fit as a fiddle. Yeah, as long as you're staying in good physical condition and treating your body right, there's a lot that you can do. Um, great question. Uh, what other questions do people have? Pop them in the chat or pop them in the Q&A. One of the questions that people ask a lot is about food to bring on the mountain. Um, and so, uh, like I said before, we provide our, your breakfast and dinner, but you'll be responsible for your lunch and snack foods. We kind of consider that the time between breakfast and dinner. Um, and so what I like to do is bring a bunch of snacks that are kind of eat like minuscule amounts, like little bites rather than one giant lunch option. Um, so one thing I like to do, I like to bring about two bars per day just because they're easy things to eat. And there's a lot of different bars out there. I like to do like the kind of like the vegan gluten-free ones, like picky bars or stuff like that. What I don't do is I don't rely on goos or gels or anything like that. I prefer to have real food. Um, so I'll bring chips sometimes I'll bring maybe mini carrots and maybe like a hummus dip, um, I will bring some nuts. I all, I love dried fruit, like dried mangoes are a great thing to bring and always bring some chocolate, at least for me. 
Um, and then the other thing that's really nice to bring is you could bring like a sandwich or maybe like leftover pizza, um, for that first day, or even the whole trip for your lunch food. Um, cause it's an easy thing to eat. It's cold enough. You could even bury it in the snow if you really need to, or bury your bear can into the snow to keep things cool. And then I also like to bring cheese. Don't usually bring the crackers cause they get pulverized, but I love <laughs> gnawing on a piece of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, great tips. And then I also put in a YouTube video of a three-day snack pack in the chat, um, and it sort of walks through um, picking a good variety of snacks for three-day time, just like Brooke described. We have another question in the chat from Michael from Los Angeles. Hi. Uh, do you recommend accelerating your training as we get closer to the actual climb? Um, I would say that yes there's there's definitely like an acceleration but there's also a taper that's important so if you're like training training super super hard and you're like exhausted every day because you're accelerating your training um and you get to the point where you're just like tired then that is not going to prepare you for those long days on the mountain so i kind of like to think about it as like marathon training for example you know, people will gradually build up their distance throughout the months ahead of the trip or ahead of the marathon. And then, you know, maybe a few weeks before the marathon, they'll rest more often and do shorter trip, shorter training runs so that they are rested enough to do the actual event itself. So I kind of think of mountaineering in the same way. Awesome. We have another question in the chat from Jason. Who is doing the first trip in early June? Are plastic boots an absolute requirement? I have lost four teeth in Nepal and wear a 49, which makes it nearly impossible to find mountaineering boots to fit. That is a great question. Um, usually in June, we do require double boots. They don't have to be plastic boots, but um, usually in June, we do require double boots because it is um, tends to be snowier, colder, et cetera. Uh, that said, the weather could be different and we might tell you during the gear check, oh, uh, single boots are okay, but that's not always the case. Um, so it's definitely nice to find some double boots. Fortunately, we do have double boots in a large sizes available for rental at our office. Um, so we are able to accommodate pretty much any shoe size uh with double boots if you don't want to purchase your own immediately excellent and i'm also popping the email address to our gear department in the chat as well we get this question um about uh getting the correct boot size um and sizes that are hard to find quite a lot and so they'll should be able to help me more um and i will say just a quick note about boot sizes um it's important, like some people try to size their mountain boots, like ski boots, don't do that. You actually want to have some space in your boot. So I like to think about having about like a thumb width of space behind my heel if my toes are pressed up against the front of the boots. Um, and it usually correlates directly with your street shoe size. Um, but basically having boots be slightly bigger allows you to have a little bit more space so that your socks are, aren't too compressed. Um, because if your feet are compressed in there, they'll actually get more cold, even if they're warm boots. Uh, all right. What other questions do people have? I guess we just covered it all. I know. That was a very thorough presentation. I even learned some things that I didn't know before. Um, and I've been working here since 2014. So that's, awesome. <laughs> that's the mark of a good webinar. Uh, okay. Let's give it a couple more minutes in case people are furiously typing their questions. And the other thing to say, I will also say that we do have, um, in addition to being able to call the gear us department, we also do have a really thorough gear list on our website, as well as like a very thorough itinerary. We've got a training plan on our website. If you look under, um, look under the Alpine Ascents uh, page for this particular trip. Pretty much all of your questions can be answered. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to find the information because there's lots of tabs. Um, but if you explore that, you should be able to find most of the answers to your questions. 
I'm also popping in a link to our gear lexicon, which outlines all of the gear we use for all of our expeditions and climbs and sort of walks you through like what is a soft shell and how is it different from a hard shell and what is a sun hoodie and like that sort of thing. Super helpful. Um, going in the chat right now. It's great. Photographs and everything. Um, I'm going to do a quick screen share really quick. Um, this is the Mount Baker um, website for our for our three day Colchin climb. And you can see there's all kinds of stuff. Itinerary, which is basically what I went over. Um, you've also got a training tab and then the gear list. I just wanted to point out one thing on the gear list that I think is really important to have. I mean, all these things are important to have, but the sun hoodie right here. Um, that is probably the most, imp like a piece of gear that has become really popular in recent years. Um, it may not have been popular, like, like even like five years ago. Um, but it's super nice. It serves as both an insulative layer, but also a layer to protect you from the sun. And you can put the hood up to protect the back of your neck. A lot of people will get sunburn on the backs of their necks. And I always prefer this to any other type of base layer. And like, this is what I wear every single mountaineering trip always. Um, it's probably the most important thing. But again, like I can, like you can see, great gear list. Um, the logistics tab has like all of the logistics about lodging, where to find lodging in Seattle, about your gear check, food, um, planning your menu, what to bring for lunch, et cetera. Um, so definitely explore that resource and you'll find all the information that you really need to know for your trip. Awesome. Well, unless there's any further questions, which you're here for, um, I guess we should wrap it up. You all can get back to your lunch hours or what have you. It's the middle of a, of a Thursday, so I'm sure you're all really busy. Uh, Brooke, thank you so much for this presentation. It was so helpful. The photographs were amazing. And I also love all of the uh, side by sides of the photos with the maps. The people really got a good sense of the layout of the climb. Amazing. You are a star. This is also our last webinar of the winter season. I think we did around six this winter. Brooke uh, hosted around like most of them, and they're all in our blog. So if you want to go back and learn about Denali or training for mountaineering or considerations if you are a female climber and are going in the mountains, about key funnels, things like that, um, go to our blog. You can watch them all uh, right now if you want. Um, and I think that is about it. Brooke, any final words of wisdom or anything? I would just say my main words of wisdom is you should go climb Mount Baker. It's one of the best mountaineering experiences to get you started or just along your journey to mountaineering. So go for it. Uh, plus <laughs> one to what Brooke said. It is a really fun climb and it's super beautiful. So we hope to see you all here in our offices uh, this summer or in a future summer. And thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you. Bye.